episode 90 of School Librarians United. I'm your host, Amy Herman. This podcast is dedicated to the issues and challenges school librarians face every day. As a school librarian in my 14th year, I found myself asking the question, where is the podcast that will help me do my job? I wanted a podcast which addressed the nuts and bolts of running a successful library program. I don't claim to have any of the answers, but I hope that this is a platform to share resources and exchange ideas. Now is a perfect time to mention that all the ideas and opinions expressed in this podcast by myself, by my interview guests, and from listeners who contact the podcast are our own and do not reflect those of our school districts. When incorporating research, I always make sure to cite my sources. So whether you are a novice or a veteran school librarian, this podcast has something for you. I'd like to extend a very special welcome this week to listeners, Penny in New Zealand, Sarah in Georgia, Andrea and Jeffrey in Illinois, Amanda in Louisiana, Lori in New York, Caroline and Sharon in Texas. Sharon sent an email with an incredibly flattering question. She wanted to know if I offered a certificate which she could then submit to her district for professional development credit. I really appreciate Sharon's idea because it got me thinking, you know, podcasts are a great way for people to learn about all different aspects of their profession. And the fact that a district would recognize this as not only incredibly customizable, but it's also free. And the nice thing is, is that Sharon had gone to her district and asked if she could use uh, listening to podcasts for PD, and they approved it. So all she needed was a form from me, and I was more than happy to make one. So one night, I sat there making a, an editable certificate, which anybody could make a copy of, and then th- it's entirely editable, and you can sort of put your name in there. And I left room for three episodes, and then you could include how long they were, because oftentimes PD is based on how long the PD lasted. So, um, and, and I had signed it already with a digital signature. And so the nice thing is, is that you don't have to print anything. You can completely fill it out. It's just a Google slide that you can edit those fields and then send it off to your district. So really cool. And it's worth asking, you know, what's the worst thing you're going to do is say, yeah, no, I don't think so. But when you can't beat the price, it's free, it's customizable, and super convenient. So thank you, Sharon. Uh, friends, I have put a link in the show notes. So when you scroll down to the show notes, the first link you'll see after the music credits will be this editable uh, PD certificate, which you can uh, use and use again. I welcome you and all listeners to reach out with your feedback, questions, and episode suggestions either on Facebook, Twitter, or the email address schoollibrariansunited at gmail.com. If you include your mailing address, I will be sure to send you a podcast sticker. And now for today's episode, Going Global, Programming for Everyone, and my interview with Allie Shilp. so excited today. Today we are having a conversation with Ali Shilp, and I have wanted to be having this conversation. And uh, Ali, thank you for joining us on the podcast today. Thank you so much for having me. This is my favorite podcast. <laughs> uh, well, you didn't have to say that, but thank you. All right. Uh, you know, friends, we're going to go with, with the real hard hitting questions here at the beginning, because, you know, I, I know listeners are dying to know, Ali, you know, you're not the mother of dragons, but you are the mother of goats. And, and it doesn't sound as dangerous, but, but I, I can't help but wonder what it is like to be the mother of goats. Oh, it's wonderful. I highly recommend it. I knew I'd like you from the very beginning because if you want to talk about goats, I'm your woman. Um, okay, so the deal was I always wanted a goat, but we lived in Baltimore City and that's a no-go. So I thought, hey, you want to move to the country? You got a deal. I told my husband I want a goat. And you can't just have one goat. You, they're herd animals. So we have lots of goats. We are adding a goat this week, actually. That library Twitter helped me name. Thank you very much. Uh, so, yes, they're just like having dogs. They stay out in the barn, though, and they're friendly and they're funny. And it has allowed me to bond with kids 
here locally because they are 4-Hers and farmers and they they have lots of answers for all of my questions. So I'm a good mother of goats. Well, forgive me. I wouldn't know the first thing about raising livestock, um, but it just seems to me like that is a, a quite a, a leap to take from living uh, in town to, to living on a farm. Um, learning from your students, it, what a great opportunity. Oh, absolutely. I feel like it was like an instant connection. Um, we automatically had something in common. I wasn't just someone from away who was, you know, came from the city and was trying to instill those, you know, what I like. It was more like, tell me what you like and help me do this because I want to learn from you. Well, it almost sounds a little like problem-based learning because you have a situation that's right there in front of you. You're now taking care of these animals and your students can offer you legitimate advice. Been there, done that. Yes. I had a sixth grader came over and trimmed hooves and uh, taught me where to get hay. And I mean, there are just so many things that I needed to learn. And they were very helpful, I have to say. They still help me today. I ask them questions all the time. Well, how empowering, too, because students feeling very capable about what they know, being able to offer advice and help to an adult um, is, is very confidence building. Yes, I, I greatly. I feel like that has been the best authentic connection that I've had is um, just reaching out to them and they get a kick out of it. They really do. So um, I recommend it. I think that everyone should have goats if you want to. <laughs> are you at all? Uh, are, are you are you a rescue? I mean, are people uh, do people acquire uh, farm animals? and then misunderstand the responsibility they take. I'm just kind of curious. I mean, if you acquire more than one, I mean, at some point there's a, a proliferation problem you might have on your hands. Um, have you considered what happens when this, uh, it's sort of like the trouble with tribbles on Star Trek and all of a sudden you find yourself with, uh, with the herd that you didn't have at the beginning? Yeah, so I do tend to collect and I'm, there's nothing, there's no harvest. There's nothing to be gained other than companionship. So, I mean, we have turkeys that I have pardoned for Thanksgiving because I just can't. They are my friends. <laughs> so I know I'm probably a lousy farmer in the eyes. I mean, this is not going to be a productive operation. This is truly more of a, a petting zoo slash, yeah, sanctuary. You yes. are a hobbyist. Um, all right, as a hobby, fantastic. All yeah. right. Well, uh, I imagine that during quarantine, you were just as busy as you would have been uh, under normal circumstances. I mean, absolutely, yes. It, and I, we feel very fortunate because there was so much to do outside, um, away from screens, and uh, just to be with the animals. And yes, we definitely acquired more during that time. So. I I say that I've been social distancing by accident since 2014. I mean that literally and figuratively because of the town we live in is accident. But I've been it's just wonderful to have um have somewhere to go outside and be with the animals. Yeah, friends, if you didn't catch that, Allie lives in Accident, Maryland. And and I love it. I'm sure there's an excellent story behind why that town is named Accident and um Perhaps that, that would be a Google search for another day. So um, you have the noted distinction of being the School Library Journal's Librarian of the Year for 2018. I've included the article in the show notes. Would you please let listeners know what it is about your programming that got the attention of the judges? I believe it was the connection of somewhere that was rural, remote, doing um, collaborations that were then global. That, that was a really big theme for that year. Uh, as well as, unfortunately, we see stories going the other way. We see lots of cuts and librarians being lost. And this is a situation where they never had a certified librarian and they decided to add one. They made that wonderful decision. So from 2014 on, look, just I could show the difference of what it means to a school if you have someone to support teachers and students and all the programs that um, I started in Baltimore County and all the things that I learned there I could bring into a small district. So that Kathy Ishizuka had said that uh, the global connection was what they were really looking for. 
Well, and I've talked to librarians who I know um, Amanda Jones uh, lives in a community where the the children don't have the opportunity to travel and and explore around the world. And it, it explains why she does many of those virtual field trips, because it gives her students an opportunity to to travel virtually and during a time when absolutely nobody is traveling. Right, exactly. So it was in Baltimore, it's, you know, you can have an author come visit you. You're near BWI Airport, you have trains. Um, but here, when it's three hours away, you, you do have to do virtual visits. So we started to do that even before now. And then I wanted to have co- colleagues and peers to, to learn from. So that's where other librarians would then share their programs with us and connect us to their students. So anywhere from Lucas Maxwell in London to Sarah Betteridge in Australia. And then I just started to grow and grow and more people wanted to participate. Fantastic. Friends, I intentionally wanted an episode which focuses on programming early in the school year. The hope is that listeners would have the entire school year ahead of them to consider incorporating some of Allie's ideas into their own libraries. So I would recommend if you'd like to do something global and because we are sort of, you know, we're homebound, you just search Lego Travel Buddy. That will, it's curated list of all the things that Um, we've done with other librarians and other um, students. So you don't even have to start something originally. You can just go out there and see all the different um, connections in South Africa and Machu Picchu and the Lego travel buddy. He looks the same as he goes all around the world. So the purpose of it is that anyone can participate. And I would love to have more and more people participate. I have Lego travel buddies. If you'd like it to start originally from my location, um, but again, you, you, it's just a search where you could go out and find, pick any collaboration that we've had and you could use it for yourself. Fantastic. Um, you know, I noticed behind you is this world map. Um, do you have, I assume that when you are going global with your students, having a large visual like a world map is going to be incredibly important for students to be appreciating um, spatially where where they are when they're doing your activities. Yes. So in the library, I have a map similar to this with pins so they can see all the different locations. So everyone we collaborate with, as well as a Google map where I have um, indicated who it was and what the connection was. And I just keep that on my website. And so there's two ways that they can the students could really visualize all the different places that we've um, met people and made authentic connections with. Well, and I want to say right now, a lot of my students love Google Earth. But the problem is with a a virtual or a digital representation of the globe is they never quite get the idea of of distance, of relative distance. I, I think when you can move so quickly racing around the earth, you sort of, you know, I don't think kids realize that just how long it would take for them to physically travel to those places. And so I I do think, you know, while a map has some flaws in its representation, I think spatially the kids need to appreciate just how far they've traveled virtually as opposed to, uh, you know, in real life. Yes, they love statistics. They love when I can tell them that this collaboration is, you know, an 18 hour plane ride or 60,000 miles or you do the, the on the Google map, the directions. They do. They love it. If you just pin from South Africa to Accident, Maryland, it's like, wow, look at all the ocean between us. So that it is, the visual is very important. So they can really get the concept of how far away people are. And we're still so close. Wonderful. Um, Could you describe your current library? Uh, You know, the age of your students that you teach and what kind of schedule you have. And uh, I'd love to hear more about what your, uh, we'll, we'll just use air quotes, typical day looks like? Sure. So we are grade six to eight um, middle school library. I have flexible schedule to work a lot with ELA, social studies, and sometimes science. Um, But really, it's open to anyone who would collaborate. The strongest connections are definitely with uh, ELA and social studies. Uh, A year-long project with grade eight U.S. history teacher to do National History Day, So the eighth graders can count on coming to the library once a week when we're face to face. 
Um, and that will look the same in a virtual library to start. We're um, virtual for the first nine weeks. Um, and they will just go to the virtual library and I will be there to collaborate um, with them. Um, so yeah, it could be, we do a lot of STEM initiatives and uh, lots of things with uh, Lego and it, it's a happening place. <laughs> To point out uh, your last two author visits, <laughs> do your students have any idea just how lucky they are? You had Anne Braden in 2018 and Dusty Bowling in 2019. Well, it's funny because the, the teachers say that and they say, "Do you know how lucky you are to have uh, you know people visit us?" and and I want them to feel lucky, but I also want that for every student. I want them to have that opportunity. So that was definitely a goal to bring people in. And I'm so fortunate that, that those collaborations worked out because those books are so special and the kids really loved meeting those two authors. I, I just I just hope that it can continue and that it works out for all kids. I know that it looks different now and hosting people face-to-face is not in the cards, but if they can do that virtually, it really makes it, it makes your program very special to have an author connect with your kids. Well, and friends, I... I Going off of what Allie just said, um, you know, a Skype in the library is an option which uh, might be uh, more realistic for people right now while we're teaching virtually. And um, there is an episode I recorded this spring with Jennifer Lewis on Skype in the library. So if you're interested, go ahead and take a look. And I think another point that was important to make is that these authors depend on school visits for their livelihoods. Uh, oftentimes, promoting books. I, you know, during the early days of COVID, I saw authors trying to promote their books you know, on a, on a YouTube uh, kickoff. Uh, I know Catherine Applegate launched a book virtually on, on YouTube. And it, it's just not going to be the same thing as sitting in front of students and, uh, or, or doing book signings at bookstores. And those are just not available right now. It's not, and those specifically, if you really want an author to uh, make their mark, it, Anne Braden went around to all 360 students and gave them a Team Octopus sticker. And she's just the most endearing person. I, I'm so fortunate she was the first visit because she's just, they're very quiet because it's not something we do every day, host a, you know, best-selling authors. So they, she just really took them in and they felt very comfortable with her. And then on the other side, Dusty Bowling coming in with snake skins and talking about her life in the desert. I mean, I feel like I don't know that anyone blinked through her session. So <laughs> just real, those two authors specifically, I'm, I'm very grateful for their time in our school. I imagine it was the highlight of the year. Friends, I'm including a link to Allie's article with Scholastic blog, How Going Global Can Support Multiple Literacies and Digital Citizenship, originally posted June 19th of 2019. With all the many initiatives being pushed into our schools, how did you decide going global would guide the programming in your school library? I can't describe it. I just usually get, it's like a feeling where I know when something is important and then I just attack. I I just, I think it's just a, a librarian gene or something, but I know that receiving postcards from the United Kingdom via airmail where another student is telling someone what to read and I just knew that that was important and having them up in the library for everyone to read. And I thought, I got to keep doing this and bring in a Skype guest. And it was just really neat. And not only for the kids, but for me personally, I learn something new every day. And I think the teachers appreciate it. And I just, it's something that we need. And I feel like it's helped us prepare for our current situation. So again, I just, I just have that feeling where I read a book and then I pace the floor and I say, how can I get in Braden? into our school because this is a book that identifies our students or Dusty Bowling. This is so cool. I really want to, you know, again, it's just a feeling that I have when I read a book or if I, um, we're learning about a location and then I think, how can we not just read this in a textbook or search this on the website? How can we make this real? Sure. I, I think that's really important. I agree. You've had these programs in your library for years before COVID-19 and the pandemic this year. Is it fair to say that students living through a global pandemic might be more aware of the world around them now? 
I think so. And I think that's an advantage to even go back um, and revisit the collaborations because I think they may have even more meaning now. I think we're better at everything that we do. I, I think before it was like this foreign thing to have a Google Meet and now it's not. And kids are more comfortable and I feel like we'll get better at it and it will add our friendships and we will continue to, this is not going away as far as how we are collaborating right now. Um, it's uncomfortable for some people, but I feel like because we've been doing it for a few years and it's like a positive thing to make connections in the library, I think it's just going to continue to evolve and it's going to be really beneficial for students because well, their life will never go back as far as not connecting. I think this awareness of something that impacted the entire planet and I, I think about it's a shared experience. Not everybody shared the same experience, but how their schools responded and 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 quarantining. I, I think it would give a, a common reference to begin a conversation with students around the world because there isn't a corner of this planet that hasn't been affected in some way or another. Yes, and we are going to connect directly with um, Melissa Tom's middle schoolers. And um, I think that would be an excellent way to just talk about what was it like for them so students can learn from one another. Well, and I, I think that there's been some caution used because talking with students about something which is for which they are obviously emotionally so invested. And um I think sharing these experiences with similar age students, you're going to have this opportunity for openness and uh, a conversation rather than having it between, uh, you know, an adult and, and students. You're going to have students talking to students about what happened when they were in quarantine or they uh, were learning virtually. So I, I can see that as really being a great thing. You know, collaborating with your teachers is a really necessary component when you work at the middle school. Did you have to convince your teachers or your administration of the importance of going global? Luckily, no. They give me a lot of freedom. I feel like if I didn't have that freedom, it would not have been a success. And uh, the teachers, they just go along with what I'm doing. I think that I work really well with them if they they can handle my enthusiasm because nothing is ever the same. So if you're okay with the constant changing, I'm not going to do anything the same way. <laughs> so if you are a very structured teacher, we sometimes are a nice balance. So sometimes it just to mix it up, they get a little change of scenery and we're going to try something different. So I feel like, I hope that it continues to be um, a nice fit. Well, and I, I think consistently that collaboration works best as soon as teachers realize this doesn't include more work for them. I, I think that there is there is that resistance because change is not something we all necessarily uh, readily embrace. So, you know, collaborating with you, as long as teachers realize this doesn't require more work on their part, this is going to catch on uh, very quickly. Let's first focus on how going global supports multiple literacies. What does that look like? Okay, so not only are we sharing ideas about what are students in other parts of the world reading, so we're connecting to um, literacy, but we may also be a Lego team, for example, who we're doing the same mission for First Lego League all over the world. So instead of us, um, you know, sort of struggling with a mission why not connect to somebody who is really good and is a, an accomplished team? So we connected with someone in Denmark and they were happily sharing ideas. And we did that all through just video conferencing. And again, the kids are solving the same problem. So it doesn't even matter if there's a language barrier there because um, it's all the same. Our robot looks different, but then you can share different ideas. So again, you're going to have different connections through literacy and ELA. Then you may have a robotics team. Then you may have a social studies teacher who really needs to help kids with geography and location. And you can incorporate all of those in any way that you like globally. It just depends on who the teacher is and what the collaboration may be. You could really connect to anyone about anything. 
So that's kind of how that all works where, you know, one minute it's a robot mission and they're sharing something about coding. And then it could be, this is the hottest book in this location. And, oh, we've read that too, to here we are. This is what, um, you know, the, the themes of geography are. Here is what our weather is. Uh, that was actually probably the most entertaining just because the weather is so different. Um, in Australia, where they were saying they were dying of heat, and our kids were talking about getting snow days, and they're thinking, what in the world is a snow day? So it was just really neat to um, to share all those different uh, views. And it doesn't matter what the class is. You could absolutely connect to anyone in any way. Wonderful. I, it just sounds like everything you're doing is so authentic. And it's not... You don't have to convince your students that what they're doing is real because they're communicating with peers around the globe. I'm curious, did you at any time have to accommodate for a language barrier? Uh, we did not. Um, so everyone that we have connected with does speak English. Um, there was a teacher for Lego league that we just used a, a simple translate, but, uh, we have not had a language barrier yet, but there are so many new creative ways to translate what you're saying. It's not perfect. Um, but so far that has not been a barrier and I don't think it will be in the future. I think people that reach out to connect and figure out ways to, uh, articulate what we're, we're trying to say. Fantastic. I'd love to hear how going global fosters digital citizenship. Sure. So when students are on camera or if they're just um, writing a postcard or they're and we're doing that digitally, of course, um, you are practicing an authentic connection. So instead of me saying these are the rules and here is a list of things you can't do, how about we model how to communicate and connect with someone for real. So we obviously go over how we greet them and we thank them for their time. And we have a purpose. Today, we're sharing about what we're reading and they're going to reply to us. So I have found that because it's real and it's really going to go somewhere, the kids are very thoughtful and they take their time. And as long as you model that and show like I connected with their librarian or their teacher and um, we're excited to do this together. I feel like that's where you show them how to be good digital citizens. And then that all ties into global citizenship as well, because you're reaching out to people all over the world. Uh, so again, I feel like that's how it ties in naturally without me. You know, I've asked kids all the time, like, do you learn about digital citizenship? And it is a lot of rules and things elsewhere. And I thought, I don't want to be known for that, that I just go over things that they can't do. I want to show them what they can do online. I want to show the positive aspects of social media and um, digital connections. Wonderful. I know that when students know that the, the audience are a group of peers, they're always going to be more mindful of the quality of work they do. It, it stops being a, uh, a scenario or let's pretend you're writing somebody in Australia. It's now you are writing somebody in Australia. Let's let's uh, do this in a way that you look intelligent and and thoughtful about the ideas you're putting down. Uh, and you said you did this digitally. You were communicating. You weren't mailing letters. Uh, well, initially, yes, we did mail, but it it got it got to be where it would be expensive. So a digital postcard works just as well as a, and, and you can also do a video postcard through Flipgrid, which is free. So I, I did, we initially started out with the old fashioned and people love getting tangible mail. I still do, but now it is definitely, we lean, lean towards all, all the digital. Well, and can you recommend a, a, a platform to, to send a uh, digital uh, postcards. I'd be curious because I, I just mailed letters uh, to Australia and uh, we know because it arrived five weeks later how long <laughs> it takes. And and I think when you're dealing with an audience of young people, the idea of waiting for five weeks to find out if your letter was received, just that, <laughs> that, that delay, you might lose some enthusiasm, you might lose the momentum that you've generated in your your programming. Yes, a uh, great point. So all, and it has to do with Australia. It was a padlet that we shared. 
And their pictures are just beautiful of the beaches. And that I feel like was the best way. We also use Padlet through our um, closures for students to share pictures and projects. So I recommend Padlet for that, for postcards, where they can all um, add their uh, whatever they would like to say and then absolutely add a picture. And then if you'd like to keep that private, you absolutely can. You're just sharing that link with whoever you're collaborating with. Um, and Flipgrid as well, because if you're if you're into doing videos and you can do just like a um, upload an image too. So those two, I, I feel like, were, have been the most successful. Well, and you mentioned expense. Um, <laughs> international postage is a, a flat rate of fifty five cents per per uh, letter, which isn't a lot until you realize that everybody in your school is going to want to participate. Uh, so you know, I, I appreciate that. to uh, hear about how Lego is uh, so prominent in your social media. Let's talk about, we, we began to talk about the Lego Travel Buddy, and I've included the, uh, the link to the travel building suitcase in the show notes. Tell us, what is it about Lego Travel Buddy that people would need to know to get started? Well, he's just he's just really cute and he comes with his little suitcase and all his travel gear. So you can put him in a scenario. He can be on the beach fishing. He can be barbecuing. It's, it's just something really cute. You can be creative. And because it's the same look, he looks the same throughout. He can be anywhere. So that's I think where that's where it worked is that they're not all different. Um, you can do a specialized minifigure. And I've done that as a thank you to people I've collaborated with made their own mini me. But the reason why I feel like this one works is because again, anyone can participate. It didn't have to start with me. You could just jump right in and say, Lego travel buddy is here. Let's follow them to all these different locations. So you could use any object you wanted. I I compare it all the time to flat Stanley. We've all been handed a flat Stanley to take on adventure, but Lego is so prominent in the library because kids absolutely love it. So that is just we just used what works in our library is Lego is huge. Um, we have Lego displays and, uh, I just can't say enough about for middle schoolers. They are not too old. Lego is not just for littles. So I highly recommend using Lego in your library. Well, and I, I do think one thing that makes it very popular in the maker space is because oftentimes when the Lego is in the school, it is absent of the packaging that it originally came from. I know trying to get kids to work with Lego when you don't have the set or the kit um, in, in their minds, and I, I'm talking as a, a mother of, of two boys who are heavily into Lego, once the kit had been built, you didn't want to take it apart because they couldn't conceive of what else that could turn into because it was it was singularly purposed. That box arrived with a, a set of instructions, God help you if you miss a page, and and they couldn't see beyond what was on the cover of the box. Yes, and my a lot of my inspiration comes from my my son Abe. He just can build something out of anything. And when we don't have a set or the set he can make it happen out of nothing. So I have watched him uh, create characters from books and thought, if he can do this and show kids, then it can absolutely, you know, it's almost like um, it just starts a trend. Like, oh, I didn't think about it that way. And then kids start building these little scenarios. You tell them to do a setting from a book. And uh, yes, I'm all for not following the direction. (laughs) So a nice and excellent segue to um, your Books with Bricks Padlet. Thank you. Um, would you share with us, and because this is something I've seen uh, on social media, but and it's something that's so tangible, uh, a manifestation of what kids experience when they read a book. Can you explain Books with Bricks Padlet? Um, because it doesn't come with instructions. Yes. So you can uh, create an object from Lego, from any book that you love to share it. Uh, So we've had Dogman and Cat Kid and The Wild Robot, just so many neat entries. And it wasn't just for me. It's from other librarians who have have given this as a challenge. And again, these are not from sets. These are all original. So um, I don't know. I just think it's really cool. Kids are so creative and they they 
it just, it's, I feel like it's much easier for them than it would be for me. So those are all kid produced and anyone can add to it. And I, I just feel like if you just have that donated set, you'll make it work. Allie, I love that when kids are generating these books with bricks, uh, padlet, you aren't obligated to have some like shrine to these creations that you have to somehow dutifully protect. I think that um, kids are so inclined to touch other things made by students that when they you make, I can only imagine if you brought in these these Lego creations for your books with bricks, um, that somebody might want to touch it or or you know mess with it. And if you put them digitally rendered on Padlet, all of a sudden that that's a sort of a digital shrine, and the kids know nobody's going to mess with whatever it is they made for for you and and this really cool program. Yes, and I know that that's tricky now with the touching. So <laughs> we can't, we have to be very careful and follow protocol. And absolutely. So when a class would come in, I could not protect, you know, that one creation. And everyone knew that, you know, we have to share. This is a, a collaborative uh, maker space. Now, going forward, I am going to provide kits for students that are in our building, we do have a very small population and uh, it would be their own. So it would be a small little kit that they could touch. And there's some work around with that, like gloves. And obviously we're going to practice all of those um, policies. But I, I really feel like it's very important to still provide tangible learning manipulatives for kids. So we are, we are still using Lego. We're just being uh, you know, extra careful about it. But in a normal world, yes. If we were touching and sharing the the uh, Lego, you the digital is great because it's there forever. I have that picture, and it, these were kids from you know anywhere from K to tenth grade making all these different creations. So very cool. They're all on that Padlet. If you're if you're curious, I, I want to make sure we include a link in the show notes because you're right. I mean this this is an activity which really across uh, would easily translate, especially into our elementary uh, programs, um, and 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 actually virtually as well because kids could post what they've made that are, are book inspired uh, on Padlet from from their home. So a neat a neat program that people could do while we are distance learning. What are some ways, uh, you've mentioned a few of them, um, what are some ways that you like to connect your students with other students around the world? You, you did mention the, the virtual postcards and, uh, and, and obviously the, the, Lego, the Lego activities. You mentioned briefly robotics. And uh, could you tell us a little bit more about that? Because I, I'd love to give some uh, ideas to our listeners today. Yes. So when you're doing something that, you know, kids are learning about in another part of the world or even just here in the United States, um, it's nice to team up with them. And Lego is very big on that, like not just, you know, learning from your little team of eight or nine, ten kids, uh, seeking out um, recommendations. And you have to come up with a research uh, project and a solution. And sure, your mom and your dad are going to say, that's really a great idea, but you, you have to present it to other people. And is this a good idea? Would this be a, a, a thoughtful solution to a problem? So I feel like if you use global connections and they can connect with peers um, and they don't really know you and they don't have any personal interest to, to give you a thumbs up, they're going to be honest. We did have our uh, Lego friends told us they didn't like our idea <laughs> first space. And we we la we still laugh about it to this to this day. Um, we were talking about going to space, and that there is a very distinct smell. Astronauts have reported back about the smell in space is very uncomfortable for astronauts. And they basically said, as politely as they could, you know, could say that that was not a great idea to focus on something else. So we appreciated their honesty, and um, I just I highly recommend even learning about different books. Uh, what is popular. It may be a title that we don't know about or uh, an author that we're not familiar with. So I, I think that it's really nice to have different perspectives. Well, and you mentioned literacy because, the, you know, 
we do know there are some books that get translated into you know over a hundred languages, and and uh, you can uh, Dave Pilkey, I, I know, and and especially um, uh, Jeff Kinney. If you go on their website, you'll see that when they travel around the world, that especially Diary of a Wimpy Kid. I know we can if you go on to Jeff Kinney's website, you'll see when he traveled around the world promoting his book that he, his book covers are in different languages, and and kids can. Uh, look at that and say, wow, that's really different. It's fun if you go to his website and the kids realize that uh, there are kids around the world reading Diary of a Wimpy Kid. So, you know, and I, I think about some of the projects that I've heard about where kids are supporting building wells in Sudan, like for um, uh, Linda Sue Park's Long Walk to Water. I know that, that those have created some some uh, global uh inspiration, as well as I just read The Stars Are Scattered, which was uh, written by uh, Omar Mohammed and Victoria Jameson. And that was about the refugee experience. And they were, I think at the time, I want to say, living in Kenya. And the the refugee experience of eventually making their way to the United States. But I, I know that there are opportunities where kids can get involved in programs that support international in- initiatives like building wells and uh, supporting refugee camps, which you could tie to literature that has been read in uh, the school. dying to hear how you were able to uh, address such a heavy topic as apartheid with students who are in middle school. Sure. So one of um, the greatest collaborations that we've had, this is where Lego Travel Buddy has started to, um, it has some teeth. This is not just a toy that we're passing around. This truly connected us to some upper level learning. A professor who happens to have a sister who teaches with me, um, agreed to do a global collaboration, global citizenship project. And she took her global studies uh, students to South Africa and they read the Trevor Noah book. And I knew all about this being the, the greatest book to read. And wouldn't it be great if we could share it with our own students? And there is the Young Readers edition, which is um, the Project Lit book of the month for September. And we read that book and her students read the adult version and they went on this trip and we sort of went on the adventure vicariously with them and they kept a blog of all all their experiences. And here this professor is teaching about liberation and the apartheid and we got to follow along. So we were able to bring, yes, a very heavy topic and bring it into our uh, eighth grade class and the students loved reading chapters together with their social studies um, teacher and myself. And it just goes to show you how this project has evolved and will continue to evolve. Well, and it sounds like it it happened because you investigated an opportunity, you followed a lead, and you took a chance. And, you know, sometimes when you sort of go out on a limb, it, it manifests into nothing. But it sounds like sometimes when you take a chance on, on, a, on a hunch that you might have something here that would benefit your students, you followed that, that uh, instinct to see if this could, could uh, become something much bigger. Yes. And many librarians have Lego travel buddies. And I will say that it's been life changing for me because I am now very good friends with uh, people like Melissa Tom and Cicely Lewis and Mr. Shu and Ricka Goss and Tom Bober and Tamiko Brown and Cassie Lee and Todd Burleson and Emmanuel Faulkner. These are people that are librarians just like us who said, hey, I'll take a Lego Travel Buddy to a conference or to an international book fair. I will introduce the Lego Travel Buddy to what we're doing with my students at my international school. So I can't even begin to tell you, I, I, we don't even have enough time. That's why I really want to share it because right now we're all searching for these adventures in this COVID world. So I really feel like Lego Travel Buddy is going to have another renaissance because we can go back and see all the places that the Le- the little Lego Travel Buddy took us. Uh, there's an ebook that Todd Burleson made at the International uh, Book Fair in Dubai where we got to see the Dubai Librarian of the Year and meet um, just new faces and places, the Dubai Public Library. It, it's just, it really is so cool. And it's so much fun to share with students. And all of that is available in the show notes. 
I really appreciate it because I um, can you tell me, is there a, uh, a hashtag? Where would we uh, be most likely to see this on social media? The Lego Travel Buddy. Yeah. So just using hashtag Lego Travel Buddy, uh, you can find all kinds of adventures if you want to be more specific, because other people do have Lego Travel Buddies. You can use my name at Ali Schilt together. Um, I wanted to say that the New Hampshire school librarians for their library camp in 2019, I had the honor of being invited to attend and each librarian has their own Lego travel buddy. So 100 Lego travel buddies were put out into the world into librarians hands uh, last August. So the adventures continue. Um, So Lego travel buddy has seen SpaceX launches, uh, Lego conferences in Ireland. Uh, It's been to the Library of Congress, Costa Rica, South by Southwest. The list goes on and on. And uh, there was a really neat collaboration where uh, two educators, one from Malaysia and one from Maryland, both traveled to Peru. And I kid you not, they took a picture of Lego Travel Buddy on the same day at Machu Picchu. And that is documented if you search up Lego Travel Buddy. It was Dr. Harvey and Dr. Cook were there at the same time taking pictures of Lego Travel Buddy. So all the connections that are made are are just unbelievable. Um, You mentioned earlier, how can we connect this uh, global project to literature? And I wanted to mention one of my favorite collaborations was with a former colleague who worked uh, in Baltimore with me. She was a corporate head honcho who decided she wanted to give back and be an educator the last 10 years of her career. And she herself was an ELL student and she was head of that department in my um, middle school. And during her travels now as a retiree, she takes us through the Waikoloa Library where they host the Newberry Quiz Bowl. So for the last three years, our students have been connected to Newberry Award winners. That is not something I could provide here. And thankfully for her and Lego Travel Buddy, we get to have that experience with Kwame Alexander and uh, Meg Medina and Aaron and Trotta Kelly. So, I mean, just how cool is that, that we we can make those correlations and people are willing to share these adventures with us? Well, and I think that, you know, when you when you mentioned that you're doing things on behalf of your students and your library and your building, I think people see you representing a much larger entity than, say, one personal request. Hey, I have this little minifig and I'd like you to take a picture of it with me. You know, you're asking on behalf of a much larger group of students, your entire school community. And I I think people see that the impact that school librarians can have is on an entire school community and and how broad reaching that is, uh, especially when you're going global like you are. Well, and it's great to have kids involved. We did have a student who planned for two years to visit Morocco with his father, and we gave him a school iPad, and he documented this adventure. He visited a middle school in Marrakesh and uh, shared what it's like a day in the life, all the different animals that he was exposed to, crocodiles, the goats that live in the trees, uh, you name it. He rode on camel. He had a four-wheeler in the desert. That, That was a huge draw for students to see someone their age on an adventure. So that that was also where it was it's starting to evolve where kids are getting more involved and I've had many students take a, a travel buddy or make their own over the summer and share their adventures. So I hope that this continues. I hope that other people do it and um, they see the benefits from it. Well, and I think that the role that you play in in helping spark your students' interest is really what it's all about, because students, un- until somebody awakens that awareness in their eye, in their minds about a place called Morocco or a place called, you know, I, I think that as school librarians, oftentimes our job is to introduce our students to ideas and things they've never considered. And maybe it's their, the, the, their favorite book they've never met yet. I mean, it's, you know, we happen to have that opportunity and to be able to use it to give our kids such a, an awareness of the world around them is really a, a powerful uh, opportunity that we all have. Absolutely. And I, you know, in my lifetime, I may never get to experience a safari in Africa as much as I would. Lo- it's totally on my life's bucket list. But just that people share those adventures or, and then I can share it with the students is just really cool. It's not just, here's some footage of wildlife or uh, people 
from all over the world. They they actually say, hello, Northern Middle, and they're holding the Lego travel buddy, and it just makes it real. It They really are taking the time to say, hello, from where in the world? I don't know. It's just very special, and I, I know that um, it makes me happy, and I know that it makes my students happy. So I greatly appreciate anyone who participates. Well, and clearly your peers agree with you for, for having recognized uh, you as a librarian of the year. So you're, you're on, the right, on the right track, apparently. <laughs> I, I really appreciate you uh, giving us that perspective. What are some ways that uh, you've mentioned Padlet You've mentioned Flipgrid. What do you have any other ways that technology helps you in going global with your students? Well, there's also um, global pen pals where you could connect, uh, which I I think I'm going to explore a little more. Um, For right now, I do depend on those uh, web tools a lot. Uh, I think Moving forward, I, there will be more options. I think people are working towards connecting more in a virtual learning environment. So I'm looking forward to actually, for myself, finding even better ways to connect and forums that are set up for these kinds of collaborations. To, to get it started was not easy um, because people wanted to connect and there were time differences and things like that. But now we're really smart about it. And that's why something like Flipgrid, when it's recorded, you can access it at any time. Um, so it has evolved. So starting it at the very beginning, say like three, four years ago, things were not as easy. I'm really looking forward to new ways to connect and other people, like you mentioned, just connecting to that book. How wonderful if there was an initiative like that out there where we, we could all follow along, just like the global read aloud where everyone's reading the same book, I think you're going to start to see more and more opportunities to connect your students. Well, I'm glad you mentioned the Global Read Aloud. This is the last year that Pernille Rip mm-hmm. is doing it. And mm-hmm. um, I, I want to think that, you know, in its place, something else will, will evolve. But I, I'm excited to see how you explore, explore g- going global this year, um, especially, I was hoping you could share with us how listeners can find you on social media, because I, I know that you have, during the school year, made it a point of of showcasing some of these uh, initiatives on your social media platforms. Absolutely. So you can find me on Twitter and Instagram and almost anything using the handle at Ali Schilp. So A-L-I-S-C-H-I-L-P-P. About the global collaboration and read aloud, I really recommend a one school, one book initiative. And if you can connect with even just one other school reading the same book, it doesn't always have to be the entire universe. It, you know, it doesn't have to always be the big global. Sometimes just doing something local within the community is going to be a great fit, I think, for this upcoming year, connecting people. Well, that's a great idea. I, I um, have not done an episode on One Book, One School, which means right now it's fair game. Uh, listeners, if there's somebody out there who has uh, uh, done One Book, One School and really would like to share your experience and your expertise uh, implementing this program, you know, what a great opportunity to collaborate with a, uh, a school across the country or around the world. Friends, do make Make sure that you check out the links in the show notes. Ali Shilp, I can't thank you enough for giving me some of your time this beautiful Sunday afternoon. Um, school has started and I know everybody is busy, but I, I really appreciate. Um, I'm, I'm only sorry we didn't get to hear any of your farm animals chiming in while we were recording. Yes, they're outside. Um, I'm not that crazy, but. <laughs> Do you have a rooster? Are you allowed? Well, we did, but you learned real quick. You don't want a rooster. So <laughs> <laughs> I have so many farm tales to tell, but yeah. no rooster currently. No. All right. So you draw the line at roosters, <laughs> but apparently, um, you know, listening to the, the braying of goats, um, I, I, I do want to ask, are you expanding beyond your, your goats and the, the animals you've had? Are you, You've mentioned you won't do a rooster, but are you... Yes, I'm picking up my our baby goat, a baby girl goat this week. 
So we're, we're, we just continue to collect an ad. <laughs> and, and, you know, when you name them, you're in trouble because now they're part of the family. Right. That is correct. I think that's my secret is that I name them all and then they're, they're protected and they're part of our family. Right. Our family, as I call it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and your turkeys are safe. They yes. are. Yes. Lady Grey and Chamomile are going to be pets forever. Do you have chickens? We, we have had lots of chickens. We have had chickens. Yes. And so eggs. You do get eggs? No. Yes. Yes. Oh, that's not fantastic. The, not the I, so will, will you be posting uh, when, when your, new, your new kid arrives? Yes, um, absolutely. Oh, yes. I can't wait to share her with the world. I can't wait to meet her. Wonderful. Allie, I wish you the best of luck this year. I'm truly appreciative that you came and shared with us today. Thank you so much. I am so grateful that Allie was able to share some time with us. She was incredibly generous with her resources. Be sure to check out the show notes today because you'll find, uh, in addition to um, many re- resources that she has used, um, she also has some recommended reads. And uh, I really am very grateful that she took the time to give us as much information as she could about how she goes global in her library program. I also recommend that you follow her on social media because not only will you learn more and more about her program, you will also get to see wonderfully entertaining pictures of her farm animals, including the baby goats who have uh, been recent additions. Now, I also want to mention at this time that... um, In our conversation, we mentioned that she was from Accident, Maryland, and I've never heard of a town called Accident, and the uh, history teacher in me um, couldn't let that one go without a little uh, search on the interwebs, and I found on the, uh, and yes, I included a link in the show notes, the town of Accident, Maryland, uh, in it's a dot uh, org and it's in the show notes. Uh, it's called Accident in the year uh, 1751. Uh, this plot of land was given to a, a gentleman named George Deacons by King George the Second because apparently King George owed him money, and one of the ways you can pay some of your debts is by giving away land that doesn't belong to you to somebody and uh, and then hopefully uh, nobody will then take it away from you but the fascinating thing was that this land where um Allie and her goats live uh is called accident and the reason according to uh this legend here is that it was uh there were several surveyors who went out to uh plot this tract of land and the two surveyors accidentally uh surveyed the same piece of property and uh when they did it was named accident because they had accidentally surveyed the same track of land. And so it's called accident. Um, another fun fact is that um, parts of this uh, uh, area were allocated to the soldiers after the Revolutionary War, again, in lieu of payment, because if you don't have money, giving away land that doesn't belong to you seems to be a common practice that was exercised at this time, right or wrong. Anyway, so I thought that was um, fascinating. I included a link in the show notes, but be sure to check out the show notes because Allie has these great uh, resources and book recommendations. And don't forget, you can also uh, access an editable uh, PD certificate, which if your district accepts them, hey, it's a great opportunity to knock out some PD and listen to a podcast. If you found this episode helpful, please share it out with your team, your PLN, and on social media. The topic of our next episode will be using Wikipedia wisely and my interview with Steve Tatro. I hope you all tune in.